Hello and welcome to ATP Geopolitics with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. As if you haven't seen enough of me already, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to give you the frontline update for the, what is it, 31st of January 2023. Uh, let's go straight to it and we're going to go to the northeast, the Kupiansk to Svatova to Kremina frontline here. Uh, as it looks on my map, something like this. There you go. Beautiful. So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, an intro to the front line today with some ideas from Defamon, who's one of my sources. He says, a lot of people say the Russians are stupid, but I disagree. They have adapted well to battlefield changes. I think one major difference between how we define success compared to the Russians is they are only, a, um, is they only are about it if they made progress, but we also consider the cost. Uh, Ukraine has just secured some large, a, large aid packages with even more things being discussed at the moment, their forces uh, now show, should not be, sorry, symbolic wins to show the world they can make progress. I believe the best way for Ukraine to secure future success and preserve offensive potential is to swap to a more of an ag aggressive defense rather than offense. It seems the Russians are willing to commit their VDV, so those are their airborne troops and naval infantry, so these are their better troops in Vukladar, Bakhmut and Kremlin area. These are as well as the Wagner cannon fodder, have proven during the course of the war to be the most effective. They have also proven to be effective in defence. If Ukraine uh, now can swap to seek opportunities to do smaller local attacks, especially in the north, rather than trying to advance, they could possibly attrit the Russian elite forces enough to get in a good position for a spring offensive. So it's about shaping the battlefield. It's called shaping. If, if you do certain things to soften up areas and then you're preparing for what your big offensive is and perhaps this could have uh, some utility I think says Defmon. We must not forget both Ukraine and Russia are actively training and setting up new units. Both sides are largely made up of mobilized personnel with very little training. I believe the deciding factors during the spring or summer will be the level of training and ammunition availability. It will be very important for Ukraine to actually be able to maneuver effectively with the new mechanized equipment provided by the West. It will be a big advantage uh, for the Ukrainians if the brigades equipped with Western IFVs and tanks will be able to conduct offensive operations at night. This is extremely extremely hard and requires a lot of training and will be interesting to see if if they will be able to do it. We know that the troops in the UK at the moment are being trained up on um, night vision equipment uh, helped by the Canadians there. So anyway, let's get to the actual front line. So in the Kupiansk Svatova area sector, says Rebar, the pro-Russian source, Russian forces surrounded a unit of the 32nd Territorial Defence Battalion in the Tverichna Heryanikivka area. The Ukrainian command sent reinforcements to the rescue. They also mined bridges in Kolodesna and Monokinivka in case of the Russian advance. Okay, let's put that on the map. So this is up in this area, uh, just north of Kupiansk. So they're saying uh, that there are, there are areas being mined around here, bridges being mined just in case the Russians do this offensive. Uh, and Rebar saying that around this area, a Ukrainian unit was surrounded until it was saved by um, reinforcements. Uh, could be true. Uh, I don't know. Um, that That's some, really all we have about this kind of northern area. If we come to ISW, it doesn't really talk about uh, Kupiansk other than a Russian saying that Ukrainian forces have transported material and personnel to the area. Uh, for what ends, we don't know whether that's kind of just general rotation reinforcements or some kind of offensive brewing. Who knows? And then we are moving down to uh, Kuzumivka. So I will point that out to you on the map before we go to uh, no report. So Kuzumivka, further down here, on the way, I guess, to Svatova from the northwest. Kuzumivka is here, uh, sits downhill from the higher ground of Novosilivska, which the Ukrainians definitely now have control of, although you know both these places are pretty much obliterated. Uh, no report says the Ukrainians are making progress in Kuzumivka towards the eastern parts of the village, near the intersection north of uh, Kvoshivka, Red Square here so that's um just to let you know that's uh that's there so kuzmivka and the red square they're talking about there um near the intersection north uh of that place <laughs> russian troops were bombarded with artillery one of the supply routes south of kuzmivka looks to be under artillery fire control uh so back to my map this is to say that uh, this 
uh, it could be this road, it could be this road here, it could be any number of uh, roads, I guess, um, is under fire control. I'd say it's probably not this one because that almost certainly already is or actually directly under control of the Ukrainian. So uh, it could be another road into uh, Kuzumivka. Uh, there were various claims about the Russians getting out of Kuzumivka and then coming back in and then under a lot of artillery bombardment. We will see uh, what happens there, but it looks like the Ukrainians are moving towards the east. Defmon says that the whole kind of front really goes back down to the south near Kremlin. So we'll do that. That's our next port of call. There's not a lot of news coming out of any of these places along the front until we get down more to Kremlin Way. Um, so the ISW says Dubrova, Belarivka, Yampolivka, the repelled attacks. Defmon says the Ukrainians repulsed attacks in Belarivka, Yampolivka. I'm closely watching this area, but there's not a lot of news coming out uh, about it. So Yampolivka is here. So you can see that you Russians are, are certainly fighting much further west now, uh, west of Kremlin than they previously were. Kremlin was under a lot of pressure um, just really a week, week and a half, two weeks ago. And now they've created that buffer zone around it. Uh, some people have said, some people are saying, yes, on the threads that, you know, all along the front, the Russians are uh, gaining ground. I would say that's not quite true. I'd say Kuzmivka, there are areas of uh, Kuzmivka, there's, there's a bit of advance for, for the Ukrainians, but generally the Russians are putting their uh, attacks all over the front lines. There are these spoiling attacks but if they are making some gains, it, the question is at what cost? So Vukladar will come to see later is an absolute nightmare for the Russians. But it is slightly worrying for me around here. Yes, Bakhmut is probably going to fall at some point soon. And there is an awful a, a lot of pressure, pressure there with a lot of losses for the Russians, for sure. But it's, it's Kremlin where there was all this kind of good news supp supposedly coming out there. These attacks were being made. But then, as you see Defmon saying, the Russians piled in their VDV and much better troops here. To Instead of doing an offensive, um, they're on the defensive, certainly south of Kremlin. I don't know who's fighting north of Kremlin, but they are they are making those advances there. So that, there you go. That's what's happening around there. Uh, Russian forces made unspecified advances in the Dubrova area, according to uh, Russian sources and attacked in the direction of Yampolivka. So this, I can't quite understand this. ISW says, geolocated combat footage posted on January the 30th shows Ukrainian forces shelling unspecified Russian targets west of Dobrova on an unspecified date, indicating that Ukrainian forces have made marginal advances southwest of Kremlin. I just can't agree with this, right? So the idea, Dobrova has been under Ukrainian control, and then under Russian control, then Ukrainian control, and then uh, contested, and I'd say it's contested. Now, if the Ukrainians are shelling west of Dubrova, they are shelling areas around here, which I have under their control, but likely this is just a large grey area at the moment. I can't see how that shows that they've made advances in the southwest. Like If they're shelling to the west of Dubrova, I would say that indicates that Ukrainians have lost ground around there. Anyway, what do I know? Um, this is the poulet Volant map, which... I'm showing you because A, it's nice and clear, but B, it also shows no yellow arrows. So it appears that the Ukrainians have are not attacking anywhere and appear to be in a defensive role all the way on this front line from Ploschanka down to Bilirivka. And uh, of course, that's that's quite a change from a couple of weeks ago. Rebar pro-Russian source says in the Liman sector, fighters of the Russian 144th uh, Motor Rifle Division are attacking enemy positions with armoured support along the line from Podliman to Izium. At least four Heimars crew are operating around that point, around that, so along that line, supplied from Balaclaya. Um, so that's all Reba has to say until they get to um, Solidar. That's to say that that there are there is combined arms going on here. It's, it's infantry and mechanised equipment you know, making some gains north of Kremlin, and it appears possibly south of Kremlin as well. Um, we'll see how that develops. Bilirivka, there have been, um, uh, again, repulsed attacks around there. And actually, I'm going to just have a little look at Spirna as as well. So in Spirna, uh, I, I, I believe, let's just find, so here, so Andrew Perpetua on his live the other night, 
says that he indicates that uh, in Spirna we have this oil refinery there, and he says that the oil refinery is under the control of the Ukrainians. So he has something like this going on, um, and that uh, underneath it there are quite uh, deep tunnels and and whatnot. Uh, and that's quite difficult to possibly difficult for the Russians to take. Uh, they are fighting over this sort of strip of forest there and also putting pressure on these strips of forest up here, the Russians, that is. And so that's what's happening around Spearn. And that's a little bit of extra detail. Um, so it'll be, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what news comes out of this refinery. Uh, and indeed, if it is quite the. Um, difficult place to take because of the tunnels below i don't know and i don't know how far those sort of tunnels go and whatnot anyway i have to have to listen to that again and check out details from around there so as we look at the northern area of bakhmut here we'll go up to you know according to isw and defmon and everyone like everywhere is under pressure vasele roslivka um Vazyivkivka, Blahadatny has been taken now by the Russians, and it's all about Krasnohora. But I just want to say the, the only kind of reported movement, I, I guess, of added territory for the Russians is according to Russian mill bloggers, that uh, this little um settlement there, so they've reached the outskirts of Sako and Vanzetti uh, village, which is 10 kilometers north of Bakhmut. That's that's here. Um so th yeah, it could be a little bit of advance for the Russians there. Uh, Andrew Perpetua, one of one of my sources, was saying that um, Krasnohora is is like a rock; it's very solid, uh, and it would fall if Paraskoviv. So Paraskoviv is a weak link, and that the Russians are moving down this road here from Blaudatny. So they are pressuring Paraskovivka from multiple sides, and indeed Krasnohora as well. Uh, but yeah, it it is it is definitely difficult around there um, as Noel reports says north of Paris Kavivka and Krasnohora the pressure remains enormous Krasnohora is contested while Russian troops also move west from Pidorodne to get to Yahidne to the south Wagner has launched another attack on Ivaniska so we'll come to that so far repel Russian moves uh, north of Solidar um, uh, and yeah, Defmon says uh, Ukrainians repulse attacks in the area of Rostolivka, uh, Vazyukivka, Paraskovivka, and Bakhmut. It's worth keeping an eye on the on if the Ukrainians can hold the high ground west of the T0513 road. However, losing some ground northwest of Krasnohor is not a big deal. Um, so this is uh, let's go back. So this is this ground here, which is north. So the Ukrainians have dug themselves in on this higher ground to the west of the road. And that is their defensive line. Can they hold that? That would be useful for stopping a larger encirclement and for stopping the Russians moving on to other places. Uh, some the Russian claims are that you know taking this road is their you know way to getting Seversk. So Seversk is seen as quite a, a an important linchpin settlement there uh, that would protect Kremlin. Uh, to some degree, so you wouldn't attack through to Kremlin if if your rear is not secure, so to speak. So Seversk is quite important as far as the Russians believe tactically, uh, and this northern pressure is perhaps a way of getting to Seversk. As far as uh, the northeast of uh, Bakhmut is concerned, obviously we just heard about Peter Rodney and they're trying to pressure Paris Kavivka from the south and there. Uh, it's fairly stable in the northeastern area. Apparently there's fighting uh, and Ukrainians are, or the Russians are making incremental gains around the meat packing plant. It's just trying to work out where, I'm sure someone can let me know, where exactly the meat packing plant is. I've been hearing about the meat packing, pa packing plant for weeks and weeks now and I just can't exactly work out where it is it might be this area here it might be this sort of um set of buildings there uh it's certainly in this area uh somewhere the meat packing plant but um yeah not exactly sure where that is anyway uh, apparently it's fairly stable around here and without the encirclements this then starts looking like marienka right okay the ukrainians could pull back to behind this river so this is the river that goes through the Bakhmutovka River or Bakhmutka River um, goes like that. And 
it's been long thought that Ukrainians, you know, push comes to shove, they'll just pull back behind the river and this will be their natural sort of defensive line. It'd be quite difficult for the Russians to, you know, to make inroads across the river. Uh, it, it could look like Marienka and fighting over 50 metres here, 50 metres there, five metres here, five metres there. So you hear about successes in northeast, but northeast, and that really is just like a number of buildings in this area, for example. Um, so really, the, the the greater threat is the encirclement, because if Bakhmut gets cut out, cut off, so Marienka is kind of a long, thin settlement. It's, it's very difficult to cut off the supply to Marienka from the west. But Bakhmut already was starting to see, you know, roads being cut off and things looking difficult up here. So we've got that road cut off, uh, which means that this this road coming down here is is no longer a supply line. We've got Ivaniska pressure towards Ivaniska. That road gets cut off. Then you've only got this road. But then if if the the Russians have this area here, then you can set up. I mean, already they should be able to hit hit these. So roads with artillery fire just how accurate that will be is is a bit of an unknown but you know the closer you can get you can start using mortars and whatnot and this road then becomes uh under fire control which means bakhmut is in trouble so what what do you do with all all your troops that are in bakhmut uh do you leave them there um in an isolated city or do you pull them out and there's now sort of calls to get you know troops pulled out of of bakhmut um but uh there you go so yeah, apparently uh, fighting towards Yahidne from Pidorodny, uh stabilize eastern lines, and then we come down to Klitschivka and Ivaniska. Fairly similar, just a, a lot of a lot of pressure still going on uh, those settlements. To the south, Wagner has launched another attack on Ivaniska, so far repelled. Russian uh, Russia also moves north of Solodar, um, and Rebar says about here. In Bakhmut, uh, Wagner are attacking enemy positions in the town's eastern outskirts near the meatpacking plant, uh, and Z- uh, Zabak Mut- Zabak Mutovka, uh, southeast of Bakhmut. Uh, Russian forces are moving towards Ivanivska and Stupichka, uh, pushing against the Ukrainians' 3rd Brigade and 116th Territorial Defense Brigade. Uh, and that's that at the moment. So, just to look on a nice colorful map, this is what it looks like to the north. Lots of red arrows, not a lot of yellow arrows. Uh, pressure on Krasnohor and Paraskovivka, as I've mentioned. And then we come further down south. It's just a nice clear map. We can see that there is growing, at least according to Pule Volon, so a growing uh, territorial gain by the Russians to, you know, that had started south of Klitschivka and is now, you know, on a par with with Klitschivka on the northwest axis. So it is really difficult. Ivaniska is, they're getting closer to Ivaniska, getting closer to, to Chazib Yar even, if this map is, is is accurate. And Ukraine really need to hold this advance, even if it's slow incremental advance, one week, uh, and the Russians are are at this road. So it is, it is an important time here for defending Bakhmut. Do the Ukrainians pile in consistent uh, reserves and reinforcements? Or do they uh, think, right, we've bled the Russians enough, it's time to pull out to preserve our own troops? Um, that's a decision that will be made, I'm sure, pretty soon. So just the last thing I want to say, OSINT Defender here says the situation around Bakhmut is beginning to look increasingly untenable for the Ukrainian defenders. Still, still in the city, Russian forces are continuing to advance both to the north and south, cutting the supply routes with an operational encirclement looking more likely by the day. Hopefully plans are already underway to strategically withdraw from the city to more defensible positions to the west, because if not, this could be a disaster in the making for the Ukrainian forces on that front. Okay, the issue here was a couple of things. So he's drawing on the war mapper map that that says, the war mapper map say, saying, you know, a close-up map of the approximate situation around the city of Bakhmut. This is last night's war mapper map. Advance further in the northeast residential area of Bakhmut. Okay, so the big difference for war mapper here is in that area there. Uh, which is, you know, leading OSINT defenders say all oh, this woe, woe is is the Ukrainians. And it is problematic. That I put on my map, what, three to four days ago? So this very recent map is actually, so sometimes some of the pro-Ukrainian maps are behind the curve on where the Russians have made their advances. And I don't think that's made any really significant change to 
the scenario. It's more to do with up here that, that makes it. If Krasnohora goes and you have uh, the Russians moving down here and towards Yahidni, then you're in trouble. If Ivanivska goes and, and you have the Russians moving up here, then you're in trouble. I don't think that is the defining difference to start giving this kind of statement, although broadly is still correct but it's just you know i would i would go more off the supply routes in north and south as he mentions of course just interesting how um how maps are sometimes like day literally that is like three days behind my map uh and that's because when russia are doing well i use russian map mapping uh, as being more accurate than ukrainian mapping and when ukrainians are doing well their mapping is more accurate than the russians it's just the, the, na the human nature right um Anyway, let's go down to Avdivka. So uh, coming out of there, we come to Avdivka. Not an awful lot of news uh, from any sources other than Rebar here talking about how they are pressuring up to Sirene, where the Ukrainians are well dug in there. Uh, but they also uh, make claim that the Russians have got up to Novelsky, uh, which they're pretty much at anyway. So here's Novelsky. There are these dug in sort of um, fortifications. This one was... It's called the reservoir. It's a former reservoir, I think. And there are trench networks around them. Um, and these are sort of dotted around where you can imagine now, several years after this mapping was done, there'll be far more extensive trench networks around this area. And indeed, apparently every tree line and hedge line um, around here is, is has got dug in things you know trenches and, and and bunkers and whatnot so this is really difficult area for the for the russians to take uh it's not just open fields walk over them do, job done stick a flag there but according to rebar novelsky the russians are at novelsky now or you know the uh, um Du, 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 du. Russian forces were able to reach Novelsky, taking Vodyanye and Novelsky puts Pervomoysky in a pincer. I mean, that would be true if they could take Novelsky, then, and they are moving in, you know, in this direction here, then actually Pervomoysky is in trouble. So that's how important Novelsky has been and why the Ukrainians have been really trying to hold on to it. It reminds me of Pobiedis to the south of Marienka. The, these kind of places, and even Ivska and Kuzmivka up, uh, up in Bakhmut, you, you need to hold these places north and south of, 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 a, of a town in order to stop a pincer attack taking place. And indeed, that's exactly what's happening in Avdivka as a whole. You know, holding these places stops russia doing this which is you know that would be the end of avdivka so each of these tiny settlements has huge tactical importance for for you know the battlefield as it is there anyway as we move on further down south it you know marienka same old same old this brings me on to my favorite uh tweet of the day from rebar which says this, heavy fighting continues in Marienka. Liberation of the city is complicated by the Ukrainian army constantly bringing in supplies and reinforcements to in this sector. <laughs> well, well, yeah, of course. It's like, um, yeah, that, that would complicate uh, taking Marienka. Uh, and it's entirely what a defensive army does. It's like, it's not that they're going to stop reinforcing and sending in supplies. Oh, they'll be all right. They'll be all right. No problem. I mean, we wouldn't want to complicate Russia taking Marienka. So, yeah, we'll just lead them to it. Yes, that is going to complicate you li uh, liberating Marienka uh, because that's precisely what defensive armies do. Anyway, yeah, so um, repelled attacks around Pobjeda and Mar Marienka. And then we come on to Vukladar, where it's uh, again all seems to be happening. Quick reminder, Vukladar sits on, on the high ground, overlooked by these uh, apartment blocks where they have line of sight uh, down to Pavlivka and Mikilska, and they can hit with artillery uh, successfully any any kind of Russian movements from, uh, from the south and from the southeast. The Russians have been repeatedly trying to take these dachas, these kind of more uh, rural settlements to the south uh, southeast of um of Vukladar and they've struggled it's been carnage uh but the Russians are claiming so let's have a look at the Russian claims oh, they they claim they've occupied unspecified advantageous lines in the in that direction Russian mill bloggers have continued to discuss heavy fighting within Vukladar and one mill blogger claimed that Russian naval infantry is advancing deep into Vukladar as of January the 30th so yesterday Russian mill bloggers claimed that Russian troops interdicted the T0524 highway near Vukladar and are trying to capture the Pivden 
uh, Donbaska coal mine northeast of Vukodar in order to encircle the settlement. Rebar claims in the Vukodar sector, fighting continues in the residential area to the southeast. The enemy regrouped and tried pushing out the Russian forces, but the attack was repelled by the 155th Brigade Pacific Fleet Marines. The Ukrainian forces set up a field hospital near the South Donbass mine where some personnel were evacuated. Other AFU units were withdrawn into central Vukodar. All approaches to the city were mined. Um, Russian forces began an offensive toward the mine from Mikilska. Um, pushing through enemy defences, taking control, control of the road near the mine will jeopardise the Ukrainian supply of Vukodar. Well, let's have a look at um, what's going on there. So this is a coal mine here. Um, there you go. And this is the road they're talking about. So the coal mine, uh, with its kind of slag heaps and whatnot, and probably elements of the coal mine there, trying to trying to cut off this road that, that is able to supply Vukodar. Um, and, you know, that, that's why they've also been previously trying to attack uh, Novomukhalivka to try and cut this road off and from other uh, areas as well, but just struggling to do so. Um, anyway, so the claims are that there is some kind of uh, advance around here. So Suryak Maps uh, talks about the coal mine uh, being heavily shelled, um, talks about this being an advance. Uh, to, actually, we're now talking further to the east of uh, Vukladar and uh, then further map suggests uh, situation south of Donetsk uh, the Russian army and DPR forces launched launch a counter attack recaptured some of the lost positions and restarted their advance towards the southeastern dachas of Vukladar so they are now claiming that actually they are advancing all, all over the shop uh, so basically you have um, Russian uh, advances now looking like something like that and that would obviously be, you know, a bit of a challenge for the Ukrainians. So it's going to be something like that. OK, uh, and they, they want to take this is where there's a field hospital set up. There are also going to be sort of mine shafts and, and tunnels, uh, whilst also, you know, attacking Vukladar from there and from the south from Pavlivka, trying to fix the forces from the south while attacking them from from this kind of direction as well. So lots going on around there. Tatragami UA, who I think has sources on the ground, says uh, an update from yesterday. All previous assaults have been repulsed so far. The enemy has failed to establish control near Vukladar. Any information about Russian forces in Vukladar is part of their PSYOPs. So the enemy hasn't, which again, this could be part of Ukrainian PSYOPs. So, you know, pinch assault. The enemy hasn't reduced the number of assaults. However, the quality of assaults has dropped, and this is where it gets interesting, significantly for two reasons. Weather conditions and high casualties. The most experienced and motivated forces were eliminated during the first days of the assaults. The 155th Brigade has sustained high casualties both in men and armour, and their importance on the battlefield is dwindling. A large number of reserves in the Vukodar area indicates that the enemy doesn't plan to give up on assaults or attempt or attempts to siege Vukodar. Information from fields confirms that the enemy's Morale is on a low level, which forces the enemy to take repressive measures. So read into that what you will. Occupiers also keep their troops in an informational bubble and misinform troops about successes. It's likely that the enemy will resume assault as soon as the weather conditions will allow and losses will be replenished with mobilized and volunteers. It's just, uh, uh, you know, crazy uh, if that's to be believed. So it says even if somebody will say it, that it's propaganda, they can do an independent check. Names and numbers of brigades from both sides are more or less known to the public, yet the enemy failed to achieve any successes despite having a huge numerous advantage. And then I showed you this footage earlier, and I think this is from uh, Vukladar, but I can't be sure. Uh, but, you know, when you're talking about how bad it is for the Russians, there, there has to be some 25... Uh, pieces of mechanized equipment lost in just these these short seconds or i mean just in this area you got one two three four five six seven eight nine uh, nine losses in pretty much one one frame or so a few frames and then and you've already got you know a good 10 plus over at the beginning of the video and then as it sort of pans out and zooms around, you've got other bits of lost equipment out here. So, you know, several bits there. There's a piece there. Don't know what that is. Could be the end, the remains of a piece of equipment uh, and so on and so forth. It, it, it is. And then you've got a few more here. You know, don't know whether there are other bits in there, but, you know, just just absolutely incredible. You know, this, so as I said previously, when you have, 
22 APCs or 27 APCs being claimed to be lost in one day by the Ukrainians. And you think that's surely not. That's that's ridiculous. And you look at this just this one area. There's about 27 APCs, you know, lost or or thereabouts. It's just a huge loss. And then when you read this, yeah, they're making they're taking huge losses and the morale's really low. You start piecing these bits of evidence together, and yeah, it, it, that's what it looks like. So I'm not going to change my my map here to to show these advances of the Russians, even though Syriac's been fairly accurate recently. The claims are that could well be sides. There might be some movement north, but there's a lot of give and take around this area. It seems to ebb and flow, and we'll wait a few days to see how it pans out. As far as Zaporizhia goes, uh, not a lot to report, really. Uh, ISW admits that uh, some Russian sources are saying there's been no fighting at all. Other Russian sources are saying there have been unspecified gains in certain areas. Uh, War Monitor here says Russian forces continue to launch assaults into the grey zones in four main directions unsuccessfully. Ukrainian artillery effectively stops most assaults. Low level fighting continues in areas. Um, so it, it's a little bit this, a little bit that, maybe, but really no effective change to to any lines there um high mods are still operating around here we, we told you about a bridge that was taken out uh in this is no report saying in ulyanivka north of skadovsk in the occupied kherson region it is reported that a russian ammunition depot was destroyed by three rockets the night before russian mobilized soldiers loaded the location with ammunition andrei sapilenko reported so here here it is there um, so that's been hit. Uh, and just to let you know that Bereslav, which is uh, Novokokovka on the other side of the Dnipro from Novokokovka. So here, Bereslav there has been hit by incendiary uh, munition. Uh, here it is. Uh, incendiary munitions have been used on there, which we've also seen several times being used on Kherson, which is pretty terrible. Uh, but that's the Russians for you. Anyway, uh, that's a frontline update for today, the 31st. Hopefully that was informative for you. Please like, subscribe and share. Check out my um, new article on Only Sky uh, about the conflict. And uh, thank you for all your support. Speak to you later.